So, my name is Marcel Schouwener. I'm a designer with The Incredible Machine. And um, yeah, like we were just discussing, I kind of, I'm not a professional storyteller. So I'm kind of honored to be excited and afraid to be here and present what we do because I kind of found a profound need for storytelling in my work um, and in the discourse of the industry I'm in. Um, and it, it is hardly there or it's, it's not actionable in a way um, that I think it's making responsible technology happen. Um, and I've kind of found a nook in the whole storytelling world that I labeled folklore. No, I didn't label it, but I thought like the, the term folklore would describe best um, what I'm trying to create and trying to do. Um, so it's kind of aimed at the IoT community. Like I said, I'm not a professional storyteller, so maybe I should define what I mean with folklore or find a definition that I find useful. Um, and it's all the cultural ways, and I really mean all the cultural ways, in which we as a group, kind of, any group, can form its cultural heritage, background, values, um, and pass it on, and pass it on to each other and future generations, and kind of, you know, figure out a shared way of life, uh, what's, what's important. So how does it translate to my IoT industry field? is um, there are a couple of really important values that we now see so underrepresented in the technology that we use today, of which three really important ones is the in inclusiveness, fairness, and openness. Um, I think I don't have to really elaborate on what those mean, but I, I'll, I'll explain them some more in depth later in the presentation uh, in terms of IoT, what it means. Um, and what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing is that these values uh, are not absent in the community. Actually, they're very present. They're very much discussed, um, you know, from Silicon Valley to Europe to Shenzhen to here in Boston. Um, the only thing is, how do we transfer those stories? How, make, how do we you know, pack them up, make them transferable? And what kind of concepts and rituals and customs and, and kind of language uh, goes with it? So when I'm talking about um, internet folklore, I'm not talking about this. But I'm talking about more in this direction. I'm, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with XKCD? Yes. It's, a, it's a little comic uh, maker, very successful. I think he's now a best-selling uh, New York Times author. Um, but um, this is like one of the most, in technology, one of the most important works of the last 10 years. <laughs> this little comic. Because, um, so for those who don't understand, I'll explain it. Of course you shouldn't, but I'll explain it. Um, so it's a, it's a mom being called by school saying uh, everything, like the whole database of school information disappeared because uh, the mother uh, named her child uh, Little Bobby Drop Tables, Robert <laughs> Drop Tables students. And what's interesting about this is, um, this is for me such a strong example of, I can go to any nerd in Silicon Valley or in Shenzhen, and we can joke about little bobby drop tables. And everybody knows what it means. It packages this whole, like, the importance of security, what it means security. It, it has some pointers at where you should think about security. And it's, and it's kind of like it defines the relationship between me and that other person or me and that group saying, hey, little bobby drop tables, and we're all like, hey, our young krentenbrot. That one was for you. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I um, split up my uh, talk in three parts, and um, I always tend to talk way too, too long. So if I'm repeating myself, just intervene, whatever, and then I'll speed up or skip. Or, but I want to kind of define this folklore and the urgency for it in, in the first part, and then the second part I will discuss some samples of our own work um, that lead into this. And then I really want to, you know, take the opportunity to, to talk to you, uh, with you, not talk to you, but talk with you about this topic because I think it's, uh, it can be very inspiring and, and, you know, I'm very honored to be, you know, with you such seasoned and professional and educated storytellers. Uh, you know, how can, how can you help me tell better stories or how, how I can help you tell other stories? Maybe. But like maybe start with little part zero. Uh, hello. So um, 
like I introduced them with the Incredible Machine, a little quaint design agency of now, nowadays two people, used to be more, you know, talk, <laughs> choosing explicitly for going into responsible tech doesn't always help your business. <laughs> Um, so what we do is um, a lot of consultancy work. We develop new products for Lego. Actually, I'm now working with Lego here in Boston to develop like new experiences, new strategies. Um, we do storytelling also on a very like corporate level, where we help companies just tell you know about the future and kind of make <laughs> their visions transferable. Um, so we're from Rotterdam, famous for being the gateway to Europe for a lot of things for cargo containers, but also like for a lot of ideas. It was the birthplace of the philosopher Erasmus, who I hold very dearly. It's a playground for architects, which is really nice. The city was basically bombed to, to shit after the, in the Second World War, and we started reconstructing this utopia, which we failed on like for, for 60 years, we failed constructing a utopia. And now when we gave up, it finally works. <laughs> And we're also, of course, we're so famous about being a smart city, but like nobody cares. Really nobody cares unless, well, I do a little bit, a little bit. And that's, and that's why I'm doing this, because, you know, if I don't care about this, then I would have just given up, moved to, you know, become a sculptor or something. Um, let me take you back a little bit why I care and... Um, a little bit of my, my background to understand how I ended up here. So I, I w started working in this field of IoT around 2012. It was, it was earlier, I've, I've been part of like one of like the first wearable companies in the world. Um, but like in 2012, I started my own company and I started kind of like becoming this advocate for IoT with an exhibition at Dutch Design Week, the day the doorbell rings you. Um, and that kind of started off where we had this exhibition of doing all kinds of concepts, contraptions, installations, where people could see what IoT could be. So this was like predating most of the consumer, at least consumer facing IoT that we saw. Um, we've done tons of stuff. We installed like prototyped sensor networks. Um, we did stupid things like rigging up our um, uh, table tennis table, to the internet, uh, oh, doesn't, doesn't, oh, I hope video works, oh yeah. Do stupid stuff like rigging up your table tennis table uh, to the internet because we wanted to know what it would mean if you merge these two worlds. In this ex- did that here too. Sorry? They yeah. did that. that. Of course, <laughs> of course. It's a, it's a natural course of things. It actually worked. That that was yeah. it was it was stupid. It didn't work, and and that's a nice thing. So technically it worked, conceptually it didn't, because we kind of forgot about what's important about table tennis and just having fun. <laughs> you know, you can't quantify fun really. Like making the movie was maybe the most fun, but as the um, as our business you know became more serious and reached new clients, we also got involved with with projects I kind of now regret doing, to be honest. I'm gonna, just gonna be open with you. This is on the record, but... So for instance, I've, you know, this is something I really uh, got behind. Um, you know, this is like 2014, I think, uh, where I worked with this um, Abu Dhabi um, convention center, where I proposed this solution where we could track people through the building and kind of make the environment respond to who they are, um, and that sparked this whole conversation of additional business they were able to build on, on, on top of such a platform, such a technical solution. Um, and it was around this time, I mean, I'm not just now highlighting one really specific project that I can highlight also because it never actually, you know, was implemented, um, at least not in this, in this way. Uh, we've been part of like tons of, at least like 30 projects that I now have question marks uh, about. Um, because it, it was, these projects had this very simple premises, premise of solving business problems over solving problems for people or problems for society, even causing problems for, for people in society in, in the long run. 
And we weren't, we weren't the only ones. So at some point in 2013, we said, this is enough. Enough. We got together with a group of people. So this is a whole list of designers and researchers from the Netherlands. We worked together and we said, like, how, what's your experience in, the, in your profession in the field of, of IoT? And, and we all kind of shared this feeling of the products that we're creating aren't serving society now and will in the long run uh, actually cause harm. We, we are profiling people. We are um, uh, giving, and this happened a lot actually, we, um, a lot of our projects involved kind of quantifying the workplace, um, following the performance of people, uh, you know, uh, package uh, like a uh, delivery man, uh, people working in warehousing, people working as nurses. Um, all these people were tracked, quantified, um, and, and this would create enormously stressful situations for these people. It was, you know, you, you know the stories um, about Amazon, the Amazon warehouses. I, I, don't, I don't even want to go down there. So we said we have to do something. We have to do something. And it's time for action, so what we did was we started writing, which isn't like maybe the best form of action, but um, <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> and in, <laughs> it's a good place to start, and in 500 iterations, uh, we produced the IoT Design Manifesto, um, guidelines for the IoT community to do responsible design in a connected world. And it basically outlined like 10 principles um, that kind of protected things like civil rights, that um, uh, promoted transparency, inclusivity, sustainability, which is a very important topic in this, um, in this field, and also foremost purpose. You know, what's the purpose of all this? And if things aren't purposeful, we shouldn't do it. So it's like 10 principles about we build and promote a culture of privacy, we design things for their lifetime, we make parties associated with an IoT product explicit. And we launched this at a conference called uh, ThingsCon with a little workshop. And we didn't know, but this kind of caused this major reaction in this ThingsCon community, a conference about the Internet of Things in Berlin. Um, and it just, it was, you know, it wasn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily a brilliant manifesto. It's, it's not the best manifesto I've, I've ever read, at least. Um, but it was so timely um, that, you know, people like Bruce Sterling, just, you know, he, he attended the conference. He was like the keynote speaker. And he kind of scrapped half of his, uh, half of his uh, presentation or half of his speech to talk about the IoT Design Manifesto and how it would fit in with the discourse that he was, you know, from a point of science fiction and a point of criticism, was kind of trying to shape and address. And this kind of sparked this whole um, uh, community in, in Germany, the Netherlands, but also like Italy and the United Kingdom to kind of openly discuss IoT as, you know, something that we need to consider from an ethical perspective. Um, I continued to work with the people um, of the manifesto um, to, I have to give credit, by the way, for this image to Johanna Nissenboim, a uh, brilliant, brilliant designer from Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll also share a work that I did with her later. Um, but we did, for instance, an exhibition called Why Does the Refrigerator Know My Birthday? We didn't know how to spell refrigerator. That's what you get with non-native speakers. Um, but it, um, so, so this was our first attempt saying all right, the, the IT design manifesto was clearly uh, focused at the, um, at the tech community and now we want to kind of, um, uh, so the path to more responsible technology is kind of educate the general public to create this demand for responsible technology, which we tried to do through this exhibition, which worked, you know, fairly well. The only thing is, um, you know, from the, the current state of, you know, knowledge and awareness of, of technology from the general public to, you know, kind of like a consumer rights demand pool from the industry proved quite a leap, 
you know, we had people over in the exhibition and we really had to explain, you know, I mean, that's, that, that was part of, part of the exhibition, explaining technology, but we weren't able to really like spark, you know, into, have this spark of inspiration with them, with the general public saying, you're right, we should reconsider this, etc. But like a side effect was a lot of people from the tech industry came to visit this exhibition and were really triggered. And, and it kind of reached them, it appealed really to them because they finally had something that was kind of like a story to what they were doing. They, like we constructed these little like flow charts uh, that were a story explaining the dilemmas in IoT and to them it was really, ah, you know, okay, now, now I see how things connect. So this this was a, like a, a, a bit of unexpected minor success of the uh, of the exhibition. Another thing um, uh, we we started doing is we we brought ThingsCon, the conference from Berlin, brought it to the Netherlands to Amsterdam, where we now uh, in in in, September, in December will have our fifth edition already, um, or fourth fourth edition already where we um, bring the industry together around the topic of responsible technology. So, and, and that's something I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of proud of that we are able to, to, to have this discussion um, with researchers, with designers. Um, the only thing is it hardly leaves the room. It hardly, like the, if I speak to people, like I, I see the same faces every year coming back to the conference you know, and we have this conversation, so like, what happened this year? You know, people say, yeah, Facebook, uh, oh, everything is going to shit. And uh, yes, that's true, but like, what did we do in, in the daily practice of our business? And, that, and that's, that, that keeps being a recurring theme in the community and a kind of challenging theme, like there's a lot of friction. So, um, uh, Kind of finishing this this a little bit too long introduction. Um, so what I'm what I'm doing now in in my career is I'm, I'm kind of like looking two ways. Like one thing is I'm still involved with the strategy and design, very much embedded in the industry, working on industry industry challenges. Uh, but more and more, um, my work is also going towards advocacy and community. And uh, but that's like less design. So, you know, there's less design. So here I've got like tons of skills and experience and education. And there I mainly, I primarily know where we should be going and what we should be talking about. But, I, you know, how do I, how do I, you know, use this side to do that? So my attempt to that is, you know, poke a little bit at this through the angle of folklore. Um, so finally we're gonna start. <laughs> 18 minutes in the presentation. <laughs> so um, some of you might like describe what I do as speculative design or critical design. Um, and I think up to like two months ago, I would have said the same. But I feel like this description is long, no longer covering what, I, what, what we do together with my partner. Uh, because we feel like speculative design is preaching to the choir it's kind of speculating on these potential futures, kind of leaving it to the imagination of the audience, the prof usually a professional audience, to kind of interpret what it could be and how it could be translated into something else. Well, where we're like, we're trying to reach the boots on the ground, literally the boots on the ground, or in Dutch you would say, the people with the handen in the klei, with their hands in the mud, uh, doing the work and speculative design is is a bit too far removed from from that one. So, I'm I'm going into the direction of like how can we how can we use these a uh, more like accessible, shareable, um, you know, consumable, snackable. Snackable way of, of addressing uh, addressing uh, the uh, dilemmas and values in in this industry. So the Internet of Things. Let me let me try to unpack a little bit what's so special about the Internet of Things because for ninety percent Internet of Things and what's happening in the web in general uh, has 
<laughs> it has much overlap and, and a lot of interaction, and it's almost it's getting harder and harder to kind of distinguish these two two things. But I'm you know I'm I'm going to try to you know have some some introduce some original thoughts to this. Um, so one thing IoT does it. Um, in, uh, in, a, in a way, it affects how we form and maintain relationships. Um, if we think of relationships that were previously based on trust, because we just couldn't know. I just couldn't know what my kid was doing. I just couldn't know what my, what my grandparents were doing. I just couldn't know what, my, what the cab driver was doing, you know, between two and three, he probably was you know, driving around someone, but he might as well just take a nap. We, we didn't know, and we had to kind of you know, build trust. You know, I have to prove a little bit that I'm worth your trust. Uh, you know, I, I give you a little bit of trust. Like this interaction is kind of um, removed by these certainties that this data and these sensors provide. Like hooking a sensor into someone's environment allows someone else to tap into that like for for truth, you know, between quotation marks, because I don't, I don't believe that data is ever really able to capture truth. It's going to produce some image that, that might hint at what's happening, but definitely not truth. So that's one thing. Um, this is one of the dilemmas that I think we need to build language around and be able to, to address and understand that it's happening. Um, and I, I want to have this conversation with, you know, we can have that conversation. And I'm sure we are all, we have an, an educated guess or a really good idea of what this means and, and uh, what's important and what's not important. But I want to have this discussion with a, a startup that has three months to bankruptcy before their investment's gone and they have an investor that's visiting them every day saying, you know, what's the business model? Are we profitable yet? Uh, what are we going to build? I want to have the conversation with these people. And I, wanna, I, I don't want to say, because, because this, is, this, is a, this is a tricky one. I have, I, I have this conversation quite often with, with people, you know, working in these kind of contexts. Um, uh, the the um, uh, the problem is the incentives are all stacked against against these kind of um, discussions, um, and the thing is, if your investor and you, or your client, or shareholder, your manager, your you know the CEO, if you don't come from the same kind of value set, it's a really hard sell to say let's do the responsible thing because otherwise we'll have backfire in five years, and no, that just doesn't help. It, it's, not, it's not a real discussion. So, okay, so this is like one of the four dilemmas. I should have, you know, copy-paste what I just said, like after dilemma number four. Um, because uh, some other things, IoT affects the relationship we have with corporations. It sounds a bit like a dud to say this, um, but it, um, it kind of... We, we kind of have, have to frame it like this because what we have not seen before is that, we, that IoT becomes an entry point to an ecosystem of a company, say Google, Facebook, Amazon, where IoT is not the business model. The IoT is not the business model, but it becomes an entry point to an ecosystem where, that's monetized elsewhere. So if I have, you know, why does Google own Nest? Because Nest has been making uh, a loss for like four or five years in a row. They, they, they don't make a profit. They don't launch new products. And still they hold on to Nest. And we don't know why. We don't know. But it's probably because it, it gives them information that's much needed to build this other business model. Or, for instance... Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unlocks or locks doors. Yeah, so, yeah, this is, yeah, the doorbell thing. And Amazon reached. <laughs> Sorry? No, in my apartment, and we have something that's on. Yeah, but it's, you know, I, I wouldn't mind, okay, I do mind to have 
a doorbell with a camera. So don't get me wrong. I, do, I don't think doorbells should have cameras. Um, but the thing is, for instance, you also have uh, Ring, which is a startup. Uh, does exactly this, but then it says Ring, but it has been purchased by Amazon. The weird thing is, if you poke at it, is that Amazon paid a thousand bucks per customer for that startup. So a thousand bucks per customer to get what, like a bunch of doorbells? That must, there, there is something there. There is some unsavory business model there. <laughs> Because they gonna somehow are going to make a thousand bucks back in, in some way. Anyway, so, so, and, 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 um, so, so now I'm kind, of, I'm kind of flipping it around because now I'm addressing it as a concerned like citizen or a concerned um, con consumer. Uh, but as a professional, I look at this. This is how we now construct business models. This is how we now employ IoT. If I... If I'm approached by a company who's previously not in IoT and they say, we want to get into IoT, this is the business. You know, it's somewhere getting them into an ecosystem, getting them into a service, get them hooked into a data store of, of somewhat that's being monetized somewhere else. You know, companies don't want to make a thing, sell you the thing and get the money. That's just not a business model anymore, which is deeply troublesome. Well, I skip this kind of dystopia yeah, because I want to. I want to highlight this. This is a very interesting other power dynamic that's shifting in our relationship to corporations. It is um, IoT is very interestingly negating the control in services, and this is like one that's really mind-boggling. There's a company called Pastime, and what they make is little um, little modules that go, go into, that go into a car and it allows the, the institutions offering a car loan to install this device in your car and if you miss a payment to the, to the loan shark, it basically blocks your car. So you cannot use your car or it just, you know, um, starts the horn until you pay. And it's, it's this weird, it's, it's a really weird dynamic how it shapes the, so, you know, why does someone who, you know, gives you a loan give that amount of power of that amount of influence in, in physical life? Repo man goes digital. Did, yeah. Did, did you pick this image or is that their actual This is their actual image. This is like, it's, you know, it's the same kind of typeface, but like. It really looks like he's the, you know, malevolent <laughs> giving her this. She looks like she's flirting with him, and his partner is kind of already depressed about the consequences. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this is this is really this is really wrong. But if you if you if you dig into it, there are so many so many scary stories uh, about this. Another thing, uh, IoT affects a power structure around work and employment. This is uh, one really obvious. Like today, this. Um, dropped into my mailbox that uh, China uh, is now using uh, in hats and, uh, uh, how do you call it, hard, hard hats? Yeah. Hard hats and, and, and like uh, caps. They embed sensors to monitor brain waves, to monitor yeah. fatigue or uh, stress. But, um, you know, this is, but this stuff, and, but this is very extreme. That's why I, you know, put it out here because I want to have, you know, highlight this extreme case. But in much less extreme cases, this happens here as well. Uh, the little, um, the, the, the scanner, the UPS guy carries with him uh, to scan the packages and you have to sign for, um, for the package. That thing is tracking their movement so precisely that it can say, you're, you're now at this address? There's a dog. We give you two seconds extra. You have 13 and a half seconds to make it to the door. You have six seconds to make it back. You can wait 10 seconds. And there's a department at UPS who have only like one job and it's shaving off seconds. You know, that I, I recently uh, read an interview with one of the people saying, like, if we shave off half a, sh half a second, that's so many million um, uh, uh, cost savings. Anyway, but like it happens in, in Amazon. I could really recommend reading this article. It's already from 2013, uh, but it completely, um, it, it kind of describes the experience of being a slave to an algorithm. 
You got it? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I can share the slides later as well. Yeah. Um, and then there's um, something that particularly happens in the context of smart cities, um, how IoT affects our behavior in public. Um, we tend to say, or like, if, you know, we've maybe heard like the, the smart city discourse once or twice before, uh, where, you know, often the, 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 the implementers or the, the users of the smart city technology say, well, we only use it for like good things, allocation of resources, whatever. But we're not too far removed from a point where certain behavior, like, the, like exp um, expressing certain desirable behavior will get benefits at some point, somehow. Um, you know, how do you, you already have at airports uh, that, you know, I have friends who are like from Turkish, uh, Turkish des descent who shave before they go to the airport because they know in the, you know, in the face tracking um, uh, um, technology that's, that's being used in airports, uh, they are gonna, they're going to be highlighted, they're going to be marked to be, uh, you know, an interesting, an interesting subject by the technology. So, and, and it's, it's happening in the Netherlands, which is really troubling to me that we have this living labs, what they, what they call, where they kind of do experiments in the smart city without full consent from the citizen or any consent from the citizen because it's an experiment, but it's not an experiment. This is going on for like years already. And I really, I really love this movie. I just have to show it. <laughs> Imagine a world where you cannot do that anymore. Imagine a world where you cannot like do your little dance because you're afraid it will affect the way how the city is perceiving you. Okay, so these are a couple of concerns and I think we're, we're kind of at a, at a crossroads. Um, we, have been, we have been seeing uh, businesses, um, because in the end it's the business model, it's the business. It's the, it's the economy, stupid. That's that's what's creating these um, undesirable dynamics that we don't want. It's not t technology um, per se. Oh, we here. So um, yeah. So so the question is, how can we how can we leverage technology as a force for good? And if we have a shared like value set and shared ethics among those involved in creating technology, investing in technology, adopting technology, using technology. I think we can still have, um, you know, a more desirable type of technology and, and society, um, but it's just not coming from these guys. To be to be very honest, we we lost trust in 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 these people. Like I think every camera here is a marker for us losing faith in in these institutions to provide us with an inclusive and and, and balanced and and fair society. Um, and the funny thing is, oh, where did it, where, where did my, oh, where did my movie go? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Boing. Oh, okay. So what we see now in, in Facebook is something interesting that we see more and more people like uh, early employees or developers kind of leaving the company and questioning their practices. And what's interesting to me is that it's like these individuals that have a, a dissonance between the company ethics and the company goals with their personal ethics and just becomes too much or they smell like the sweet money of a book deal. But like there is... Um, <laughs> That, because that's that's what's happening, um, but you have these people kind of speaking out and kind of give us a peek into the mindset of these organizations, saying, "Hey, you know, we want to do different things, or we should do different things, but we're not doing it because the organization doesn't help." Um, and I, I picked this little clip. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't know this guy before before I picked this clip. To to be honest, but he is supposed to be the president of. Facebook, whatever that, whatever that means, but he was like an early employee. Um, now I want you to 
listen not only what he says, but also how he tells this. And then I'm going to loop it back to folklore. No. When Facebook was getting going, I had these people who would come up to me um, and they would say, you know, I'm not on social media. And I would say, okay, you know, you will be. And then they would say, they would say, no, 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 no. I value my real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence and I value intimacy. And I would say, well, you're a conscientious objector. That's okay. You don't have to participate, but you know, we'll get you eventually. <clears throat> and, and, and like, I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. <laughs> because it, the, un, the unintended consequences of, 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 a, of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people, and it, and it, begin, and it, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other, with, you know, it, you know, it, 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 it probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. It, God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. You know, if the, if the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, that thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's, a, it's, a val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. And I just, I, th I think that we, you know, we, the inventors, creators, you know, and it's, it's me, it's Mark, it's the, you know, Kevin Systrom and Instagram, it's all of these people, um, understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. Okay, so, Besides what he's saying, what I find interesting about how he tells this is um, if it comes to values, he has very poor language to express himself. But when it comes to building stuff and hacking stuff, he's very explicit. So for instance, he's, he's struggling for words when he wants to explain what Facebook did. So he's like, eh, but society, and you know, he's, he's trying to... Um, find something that resonates with the audience, but he cannot find it. He cannot find any precedent or any, any kind of preconceived notion with everybody that we, like a shared imagination to tap into it. But when it comes to, we're gonna exploit the vulnerability of the mind, that's a very clear concept that comes from software, that comes from hacking, that he just puts out there as a, like, as a, as a fact that he knows, like, all right, we all know what we're talking about. Exploit vulnerability, of the mind, boom, there's a concept that we know. But like the adverse implications of Facebook to society, he has no cleats. Like, well, I don't know what it does to the minds of children. Um, and, that's, and that's interesting. So um, he has the, the move fast and break things type of language uh, for the engineering part and the hacking part, but like for the implication part, there is no language. There are no examples, there are no notions, there's nothing that he shares that helps us understand what's, ac what, what's actually going on. We can guess, we can guess, and now we have, you know, some, something in the White House that helps to understand, but, you know, it, it, he, doesn't, he doesn't help us to, to do it. So, you know, how can we help uh, poor Sean to express his uh, concerns? Um, and I think what we need, and I'm going to finally loop it back 38 minutes into the presentation, that... Um, what he needs is sticky stories, sticky stories that live in our collective imagination to discuss these things. So these are, he needs a sticky tale that lives in our collective imagination that's normative in a sense that it, um, it, it encapsulates the values he wants us to align on and to understand the discomfort um, with the current state of technology. Um, 
and, and there's actually a lot to tap from uh, that he isn't, he isn't doing because we have a common tradition, we have a collective heritage. Uh, it just lives outside of the scope of technology, usually, that, that type of uh, discourse. I mean, there's pop culture. Uh, where we could uh, tap into. We have, but the problem is we're now kind of trying to build um, a, a clear, comprehensive story on a decade of algorithmically curated bubbles, which means, which by definition, by definition means it's not shared. It, it lives in separate bubbles and we, and we no longer know what kind of stories and rituals cross those bubbles and which ones aren't. Um, and, and the only thing that we know that crosses is the bold and the extreme. You know, it's the Trump and the Brexit and the big stories. But like the small, we also need small stories. We need small stupid stories to, to explain these things. Like we need artifacts that kind of package certain values that make it, make it easy to discuss and, and um, to, to build a community around those uh, values. So, you know, are we talking art? Are we talking propaganda? Uh, no, I think creating folklore is more uh, an act of design than art because you do it intentionally to package a message, but it's not propaganda in the sense that you kind of campaign those messages out. They need to be adopted, absorbed into a community and, and you know, uh, naturally transferred like in, a, in an informal way because that's how we build our friendship or whatever, our professional relation over something that we both care about. I want to share something with you, you share something with me, and we both think, oh man, this really helps me understand this or this better, or we both have a good laugh about it. You know, this is, this is kind of like the, the thing closest to Facebook folklore, the, um, the, the, the Facebook guideline statements people post on their, uh, on their, uh, on their social network, uh, on their timeline. So, um, so what, I'm, what I found lacking is that we have all these profound and big and scary stories that don't help me as a designer or a developer to kind of like practically move from A to B. You know, Trump in the White House doesn't help me build a sign-up form for a, for a service. Or doesn't, like, uh, Brexit doesn't help me to understand uh, why or why I shouldn't, why I sh should or shouldn't put a sensor in the hallway of a building. Um, and, and we only have these, these big scary stories about things like the data, the algorithm, the robots, you know, but what is it? Let, you know, how can we, how can we, how can we unpack this? And a, 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 an intern of, of, my, uh, of me made this little collage of you know, this kind of reflects how we talk about algorithms. Over two billion people. That's a lot of power. But now, authority is beginning to slip away, to shift from us to other entities, and in particular, to shift from us to algorithms. According to the Chronicle, Google blamed an algorithm for highlighting stories that falsely identified an innocent man as the shooter. The algorithm likely determined that Dr. Dow was one of the least valuable customers on the flight at the time. Now, you might be asking yourself, okay, then how can I get the algorithm to like my videos? Pretty simple. Get the audience to like your videos. That's because the algorithm follows the audience. Okay. So it's almost anthropomorphizing the algorithm as an entity with a will and a driver and like the beast. How can we tame the beast? No, algorithms are made by people. It's stupid lines of software that we can change. You know, we need to be wary of it because now algorithms start to write themselves. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Um, but it's, you know, it's technology is made. It's made by people. It's not some transient entity that lives, you know, among us. No, it's a, it's a thing, it's a line of software, and there is a developer somewhere writing this piece of code, and he, he or she needs to know what is, you know, what's happening for what reason at what moment. So I want to share a couple of examples because I'm definitely not the first one thinking about this. Um, I'm sure you all know Black Mirror, right? And that's interesting because 
um, you know, no matter what we think about it, whether it's, it's good or bad, um, I think it's, it's, it's really successful. It's really great because I can say whenever, you know, a client of mine proposes something, I can say, that's really Black Mirror-esque. <laughs> and we know, you know, we know. I just need two words and we have packaged this whole, you know, this whole meaning. And that's, and that's great. And, and I wish I had more of these, I more of these things. The downside of Black Mirror is it's very dystopian. It's very disrupted. I mean, it's not too far removed. It's kind of close to where we are, but it's really dystopian. Of course, no. So it's, it's almost like binary. So if I say this very Black mirror like if as soon as I drop the Black Mirror, like there's no coming back. You know, then it's, then it's either dead or I'm out or the concept out or, you know, there's no moving forward from, from labeling something Black Mirror. Something really a lot better, um, really good. I mean, this is to me is one of the best examples of, of IoT folklore uh, there is. And I don't know, do you know this video? No? Okay. Damn, okay, then I should maybe tone down my statement a little bit. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, um, so maybe before, before I, sh no, I'm, I'm going to show you the video first. Um, I'm going to show you the video first and then tell you about its impact. It's pretty long though. column that for the Lib Dems down 27%. Good. Hamburg, Germany, Hudson, 
laying down their soul hatred and kind of this book. Why is Paul doing this to them? Story Musgrave improvised a solution. <laughs> it was a success. The astronauts were elated. All right. And what's so great about this? And now let's see if I can easily go back to the presentation. What's so great about this? It's not only it's like a fun. You come for the fun, but you kind of stick for the message and the confrontation. And what is so interesting is the impact it had. Because this video had like a really profound impact on the industry. Um, it kind of changed every conversation about healthcare and elderly and IoT that I've been part of. And I, I haven't been even the one showing this video. I've worked with Philips and Johanna Nissenboim and um, Delft University of Technology on a resourceful aging project. This is what they show. This video is what they show at the opening of the project, the kickoff of the project. And everybody knows that this encapsulates the values that they want to pursue with the project. You cannot do, after seeing this, you cannot do surveillance anymore. You cannot do remote, like, monitor, like, sneaky monitoring of your, of your grandparents. So, you know, in, in terms of, like, example, I think, I, you know, I won't be able, like, from, from here, the presentation's only downhill. So it's, um, but now I'm gonna, you know, I hope I kind of made the case for folklore and what it is and how you package it. And I wanna share a couple of samples from our work. Um, <coughs> how we are trying to attempt to contribute to folklore, because don't get me wrong, I don't think you can create folklore. Something becomes folklore if it's adopted by a community and understood for what it, you know, contextualized and understood and appropriated. And then it becomes folklore. You cannot like push something into, into it. So you know, some of the things I'm going to show didn't have any impact at all. Um, so one project I want to show is ViewSource uh, Shenzhen, a project we did in collaboration with um, Mozilla, uh, the Waving Cat, it's a German consultancy, and, and the broader ThinkScom community. And kind of like what we wanted to say or what it, what it means to convey is, okay, one is China is becoming a dominant force in technology. The Shanzai days are over. I don't know if you know the term Shanzai. Shanzai is basically the label for low quality ripoff products. Um, although that's, that's the Western connotation. There's actually more to it um, from a Chinese perspective. Also kind of like a few very positive connotations actually. Um, uh, because it's also like the practice of copying and improving upon each other. Um, anyway, but the, the traditional Shanzai days are over, uh, and we have a lot of catching up to do. Like, things are happening fast in, in China, and we need to understand it. And we can no longer hide behind China, that's crap, and surveillance it will never reach us, because it's already reaching us. Uh, but also that there's hope for responsible technology. Um, so this is like a, a message that we want to convey, and I can do a presentation, but like uh, we decided to make a little document, a video document about this experience. Uh, so we made um, a half an hour documentary about this, of us trying to create a product uh, in Shenzhen and interacting with the ecosystem and kind of um, uh, peeling the mystery layers of the maker the maker ecosystem in Shenzhen. Video is kind of We started out looking for hardware at the place Shenzhen is arguably best known for. Enter the Huachang Bay electronics market. Here, 
the market stands act as a traditional distribution interface, but the deals that are made here involve volumes that would probably surprise you. There's a good chance this is where we find the hardware we need. We bought a few components that could work for the prototype. But before we actually go through the trouble of building it from scratch, we want to find out if we can get a ready-made solution from a manufacturer. So we went to a manufacturer of a smart bike lock that our fixer found through the magic of WeChat. If you're not familiar with WeChat, this app not only allows you to connect and communicate with other people, it also acts as a platform for other apps. Social media, marketing, money transfer, flight booking, you name it. You can even use it to connect to Wi-Fi. We had an off-camera chat with the bike lock manufacturer, and they agreed to help us out by providing a sample of their product. Theirs was a smart bike lock that had already undergone production, and it comes really close to our requirements as well. If all goes well, we might have found ourselves a supplier of a ready-made solution. For Shenzhen, they work in a breakneck speed. I mean, you guys came in in November last year, and you probably find one by that company. And if you do the same query today, uh, you probably find 30 ready-to-go solutions. Interestingly, we can also look at it as a forced open source place. Uh, if you have a good idea, if you don't share, someone will figure out how to replicate it. So what we, what we tried to do with a little documentary, it's not as a it's not flashy and exciting like the Wired one. Um, it's, it's pretty toned down in the tone of voice, but it's really practical. And we really try to bring Shenzhen alive for those, like for people like us who are excited about a project or a product and want to see how they can make it in, in Shenzhen. You come for this, but then when you watch the documentary, we kind of put in things about WeChat. We put things about the maker movement. We also have some hints uh, into like the like tight knit relationship between government and industry. Uh, and it kind of informs you. And ha after half an hour, you know more about Shenzhen than you would have known if you would go there. Or if you watch the Wired documentary, which is like in terms of like production, it's like the best you've ever seen. It's like super nice with drone shots and like really high profile talking heads, but it doesn't demystify Shenzhen. It only builds up the mystery, you know? And, and I really, you know, I, I cannot, I cannot talk about the documentary without showing this clip. Smart bike locks. A term that had gotten us nowhere six months ago now seems to be produced by more than a few manufacturers in Shenzhen. Our fixer told us that the sample that they wanted to give us was using an old board and we were told to come back the next day. In the meantime, we figured we'd try some of these bikes out for ourselves. For research, of course. Yeah, so, okay, so this was uh, a little nugget about the documentary, and I'll, I'll share the link. I can share the link later. Uh, but it, it kind of demystifies uh, Shenzhen, and we had a lot of response to this. Actually, people being inspired, like, after the documentary to go there themselves. Um, so, you know, you come for the adventure, but you learn about a new reality. Another project I want to share is Effective Things, Entanglements of the Smart Home. It's a more like a, this is like a more like a traditional speculative project. Together with Johanna Nissenboim, who also did the gray toaster with the A-B um, testing uh, things. And here we want to address the notion uh, that the smart home doesn't exist. It really doesn't exist. It will never be there. It will never live like the Jetsons. Really, it won't happen uh, because technology will never be able to interact as seamless as we think with us messy humans, unpredictable, messy, erratic uh, humans. Now this is, uh, in, in my industry, is a challenged notion. Like some people, some companies are now finally kind of accepting that it might never happen uh, or it might not happen. But there's still these advocates that really think we should be 
you know, rubbing, rubbing our fridges or, uh, uh, you know, remove all human interaction because we can do everything with, with an app. So uh, what we want to say is the smart home isn't the intelligent home. And for this means, we produced um, four videos um, that we are intended to be slideshow worthy clips. So we, we made them so people can drop them in their slideshow, just like how Superflux, the Superflux video about the older man is always used in, um, in presentations about IoT and healthcare. We wanted to create a similar kind of thing where you have these slide, just drop in, drop in values for your, um, for your uh, smart home project. Right. The last one. So these are just, you know, we've, I've, I've shown them to people at, at Google and they were really like, ah, we're never going to use it. Um, but um, 
so not maybe the impact we were hoping for, but um, yeah, it was, it was a fun experiment. Uh, another project is called the Transparent Charging Station. Uh, goes, it, it, it is about the, the smart city, and um, it, it kind of unpacks the idea of if we want to have algorithms in the smart city, um, we will have bias embedded you know, point. That's just, you know, there's no way of designing algorithm without bias. But if, you know, if we accept that these algorithms will be there, we'll have to have a way to allow for citizens to assess and scrutinize these algorithms. So how do we do it? Um, so it was interesting that the, the organization who commissioned this project from us had already been telling this story, you know, more elaborate, but like for two years, and everybody would say, yes, yes, well, that's interesting, yes, of course. And then in practice, nothing would happen. So they came to us and say, can you buy, can you make a, 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 a sticky thing, an insulation that kind of makes it hard to neglect that this is necessary or also imagine that it's possible? So um, in the near future, more cars we made a little electric. movie. That's great. And if we could also ensure that all these electric cars were charged smartly by charging at those moments the most sustainable energy is available, then we could all be driving using the power of the sun and the wind. How cool is that? So this is not a movie made by us, this is made by the company. Some algorithms deciding exactly which cars get charged first and fastest. So perhaps your neighbor has priority because she's a doctor or a diplomat. Charge more slowly because there's not enough wind and sun. The problem is, at the moment you can't see why the neighbor's car has been charged fully and yours hasn't. And that can lead to misunderstandings, leading to irritation. Therefore, what we need is transparency. We need to know how much power is available and who gets what share. In that way, everyone can check whether the charging session was fair or not. But how? This challenge was accepted by our designers. After much thought, testing, and tweaking, they came up with the design of first prototype, introducing the transparent charging station. This charging station makes the invisible visible. You can see how much power is available and how it is shared. Once ready, you can play back the charging session and film it with your smartphone. If your car wasn't charged as expected, you now have a virtual receipt. If necessary, you can use this to file a complaint. Currently, the prototype is designed... So it's, it's kind of interesting that this is how like, the company kind of reinterprets our work to tell their story, because this is what we made. It is um, an installation intended for exhibitions and musea, etc., where people can try out uh, how an algorithm decides over them. And then we use the little Tetris thing to kind of understand what an algorithm is. Um, so again, you come for like the smart charging because you know most of the audience is interested in smart charging thing. But like we provide them with a means to think about and discuss what an algorithm is. An algorithm basically divides things up among a group of people or de de decides who gets, who gets what. And that will make very very vis visual. I'm seeing I'm kind of running out of time, so um, I'm going to quickly go to the to the last. Uh, oh shit! I have two more projects. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to skip this one. Um, is it? Oh, does it come from my computer? Yes. Um, oh. Um, <laughs> is it in my head? Okay, um, we did a, um, so this was actually a project that preceded our trip to Shenzhen because you already heard about smart locks that we were looking into smart locks. Um, because we were working on a bike sharing uh, project and it was funny because this was actually intended as a kind of a speculative project to have people think about the business models around technology but accidentally it turned into an actual product that's now being developed. Uh, what we wanted to demonstrate is, um, um, so can we reimagine a different economic system, a different driver for technology uh, to happen? Uh, and for this, we um, made Velocracy, 
um, which is a business model for bikes for bikes that's not owned by anyone. So the idea is we have a bike sharing platform that's not managed by a company, that's not managed by an organization. It's a bike with a smart lock um, that is able to make its own money, like to make to actually receive funds, uh, collect the funds, uh, and then collaborate with other bikes to purchase new bikes or purchase maintenance for the system. Um, this is something that wasn't previously possible in technology, but while we were working on the project, it suddenly became possible. So there was a kind of like a weird thing, um, a weird order of events, how we, uh, how we did this. Um, but so what we wanted to prove is, what if you build a very competitive, almost capitalist system inside, which provides like a service uh, without any uh, capitalist incentives to grow, maintain, shrink, redistribute, uh, whatever. So we we launched this at Dutch Design Week and a couple of other festivals and um, uh, conferences, and and people are now actually you know getting back to us and saying like people like someone came up with a cow that makes their own money by selling its own milk, uh, or last year at the Dutch Design Week there was a soda machine who was um, uh, making money from selling soda, advertising on Facebook and Twitter, and then making money out of it, like as a, a kind of like a demonstration of this post-capitalist kind of um, uh, form of doing business. It's ju it was just a demonstration of like we can do business in a different um, in a different way, but actually it seems to uh, really catch on, and it became this kind of nugget in discussion with with. For instance, the city of Rotterdam is now supporting us, and they're giving us money to develop this. Um, but uh, so I kind of rushed through this because I really I, I didn't want to lose time to to uh, present this um, final project, which we finally documented because it's already two years old. Um, but we finally documented it, and it's Iris, the honest home assistant, and it addresses a very important notion that is now very abstract in the way we talk about it, but like the technology, um, uh, like home assistance. The people here in, in the United States uh, are you know, pretty open to, for instance, the Echo, the Amazon Echo or the Google Home. It's not so much in Europe yet. In, in China, there are different approaches to it. Uh, they're, they're doing more like embedded AI, but here, we, we don't seem to have much of a problem of, with this uh, microphone uh, in our home. And we often think of it as being like the downside of it if it's snooping on you, it's listening in on you. But it, it's actually not really happening if you, you know, wire shark the communication between an echo and a server. There's not much going back and forth, but it's also not the scary thing. But that's, that's the sticky story that we're sharing. But what's, what we're not sharing is that this... Um, this, this little device actually gives you a very abstract, slim part of the truth uh, to you that drives purchase behavior, um, uh, the information you share with your children, um, maybe also how it shapes our social relationships. Um, and we wanted, and, and this is like very abstract, so we wanted to make it again like a sticky contained nugget ready for folklore adoption, um, and that turned into this project. Now we need sound. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Please book my ticket to London. 
where would you like to book your ticket? KLM or EasyJet? Is it just time? Okay, book an EasyJet. This flight might have a relatively large number of people from lower income classes. Beware, this could lower your citizen score. Don't forget to set up your profile. Paris, set up my profile. By continuing, you will agree to my terms of service. If you need more information, feel free to ask me about it. To verify your account, I require your email address and credit card information. Would you like to continue? Sorry, right. you know how I trust you. In fact, you don't even have to ask me for permission. Linking information to your personal profile. Sit back and relax. No need to tell me anything. I already know everything about you. By the way, your mother called an hour ago. You might want to return the call. Really? Why didn't you tell me before? Please call Nancy. Let's see if we can reach your mother. No response. Do you want to look up her current whereabouts? <laughs> sure. Tell me where she is. All right. Let's find out where she is. Looks like she is shopping. Wait. Unbelievable. She is still shopping at XP supermarkets. Shopping at XP lowers her citizen score, thereby lowering your score as well. Better convince her to shop elsewhere. Your citizen score dropped below 3,420. You can now only interact with people who have a citizen score above 10,000. Facebook error. Your Facebook engagement score is too low for us to monetize. I can no longer be of service to you. Goodbye. So the scenarios about the citizen score are actually based on the scenarios now playing out in China with the citizen score. I don't know if you've heard of it. But, um, so we inquired with a couple of Chinese friends to get some you know, actual scenarios of things that are happening. Um, it's funny because we, we, we just launched the video two days ago, but it's already kind of already raked up 400 views. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for us, that's, that's a lot of views. <laughs> okay, so that concludes what I wanted to share today, our kind of direction. And I really, yeah, I'm curious to hear what you as professional storytellers and think. So... So can I ask a specific yeah. yeah, I was just going to link two things. Uh, so why, Marcel, uh, first of all, you're, you're around uh, in Cambridge for mm -hmm. a short time being, so that was a good momentum to have you visit the Open Doc Lab. But we've had a co-creation studio workshop here around the Internet of Things. Uh, part of One of the project was Internet of Shit, uh, directed by Brad Gaylor, and Marcel is uh, collaborating on that project as rethinking objects that could be used to tell stories. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of a segue into telling stories with uh, storytellers, but as well designers who are uh, tapping into understanding our relationship with objects and creating these objects. So kind of just laying it why, you know, there's a segue into rediscussing Internet of Objects and how it's evolved and how it taps into a lot of subjects that we discuss here as well. Uh, but seeing how storytellers can appropriate objects to tell stories, I think, is something that can be interesting as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wait, sorry. I wanted to be full core. It's a great concept, um, long, rich history of it. Mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to understand like, precisely what you mean by it. And what I mm -hmm. kind of keep hearing is stories that will spread, stories that will be embraced by people, mm -hmm. embraced as their own, and shared by Yes. Them. And I don't know if you've read the, the Jenkins Ford Green um, Spreadability. You know, no. So this tries to, to flip notions of viral, where the notion is mm -hmm. the message does the work, to say, no, no, we, the people, keep spreading. So mm -hmm. it shifts the focus to the, the agency of humans and spreading stories. And it's, it's maybe a thing to look at. So it's a book, and then there's a kind of extended website. But, but do, I, do I have that right, that really what you're looking at are the, the, the shift to, um, to human agency as the spreader? Like things that yes. and they spread becomes the culture. Yes. We, we, we really want to... Um, so we see that these, these values are already there 
among a lot of... So, okay, so maybe the, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is to inspire <coughs> different conversations in, in technology um, among these overlapping communities there. Um, and they already share a lot of values. They just lack the kind of like stories and concepts to, to tech it to. Like the shared, the, like the, the relationships through these stories, they, those, are ha those have yet to be created because either the stories that are there are very dystopian or they're very, uh, or they're weak. Uh, but we want to create like this, you know, precise, kind of precise stories, concise and precise stories that allows people to form a relationship over things. So they kind of, kind of, in the simplest form, agree on like we share these values. And that is part of our identity. And, th and that's also why it's not like just content or just like propaganda. We really want to have people adopt these messages because it resonates with, like kind of like build their identity yeah, so around those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, I, um, I guess what I'm missing in terms of your using allegory, using folklore is the sense of allegory that's mm -hmm. associated with folklore because a lot of people have, you know, there's, we use pop culture to do culture change mm -hmm. work, which is often narrative shift or sort of discursive shift. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based predominantly on looking at value systems, what we call BPS, mm -hmm. value problem solution action, mm -hmm. and then appropriating, you know, pop culture sort of narrative strategies as a way of kind of changing cultural yeah. norms. So here, I feel like if you're using that term folklore, for me, it resonates. I mean, I think about allegorical structures mm -hmm. in terms of story, you know, going back not only to like, you know, the hero's journey or these type of things, but really looking at, if you look at Ecstasies by Carlos Ginsburg, um, that might be an interesting reference point, because he looks at all of the different allegories across cultures, mm -hmm. what is the unifying thread in this, yeah. that then maps to folklore in terms of storytelling strategies. How so? Called ecstasies by Carlos Ginsburg, not to be confused with Alan. Mm -hmm. They're, they don't know each other. I think they're different time frames. But, yeah. um, yeah, so I feel like it's, you're using that word, but I, if you're, but what you're really talking it, about is values, the underlying mm -hmm. values that shape culture. Yeah, I'm I'm talking about the values, which is like. Yeah, you're right. It's it's going kind of like a back and forth because we there are already like values that kind of need. We want to strengthen these values. We want to promote like these values in the in the communities. They're already there, but we want to bring them to the surface and make them easier to discuss. Because like often in the conversations we have, or I have. Is that on a human level, as as you know, on, a, on like in different, in different overlaps in communities, like people share these values, but they don't bring it into like the workplace or bring it into the professional dynamic. So that's what we're trying to trying to accomplish. So yeah, then then it's so are we trying to promote values or create values or um, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm too liberal in the use of the term, but. Um. Well, that's what, I mean, I think your challenge is interesting in terms of trying to access like investors and kind of stakeholders. I mean, I also I had a kind of failed startup, and part of the issue was because of the, this, the kind of dissonance between like our value system and our mission, and uh, yeah. open source, and like the you know angel investors and other people. They, they, was like a, a disconnect. Yeah. There was no match. And I feel like, but yet the videos that you've shown us are really targeted at a general audience to become educated as opposed to maybe more targeted mm -hmm. at these other figures who's, I mean, you're trying to sort of mm -hmm. push the culture of industry, mm -hmm. really, right? The yeah. value structures that live within sort of commerce. Mm -hmm. And then how do you do that, especially yeah. if you want to make responsible tech and you're talking about startups and mm -hmm. the key investors in those startups. Yeah. Maybe it would be a slightly different um, approach to storytelling. Yeah. To your strategy. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. And True. in a way, it's sort of story hacking. This, we think of narrative as, as, a, as a storage system, essentially. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it can reduce a lot of information, a, a temporal evolution into a compressed little unit, a story. Mm -hmm. 
story of progress. Like, I'm investing in this company because I want to return. Like, that narrative is really big for a lot of people in yeah. the VC world and startup world. But if you can have that story with an alternate one that right. says, actually, here's, here's an equally coherent nugget of, that, that helps us sort of reframe it. It's a, it's a happy yeah. story. In a way. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so what's maybe interesting, like over the summer, we worked with an investor to write their investment thesis. So they didn't want to invest in the startup directly, but already like had like, you know, the intention to go and invest. And they asked us, like, how can we invest this responsibly? And then we got back to them with a beautiful story, like a beautiful thesis, like a really rational story. They didn't, they didn't really understand what we were poking at. And then we went into, you know, not just our stuff, but like a lot of different, like we spoke to a lot of different people, a lot of different like media that we visited, a lot of different discussions that we had. And then almost unchanged, they adopted the thesis later. So we kind of could work with them to change that value. Mm -hmm. Was a pretty, was a challenge. <laughs> Sorry. So the audience you're trying to get into the general public public so they'll become advocates for no no responsible are you trying to reach technologists and make them think about what they're doing yeah so we want to really so 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 currently so the the things we saw now is general audience up to the level of kind of like product managers product management uh, because those are ultimately the one commissioning commissioning features, commissioning products from, from engineering yeah. teams. So, you know, and we want to touch people on the basis of, you know, just have common sense of being a human being. Hopefully that works. But yeah, so but that's, that's, the, that's the attempt. But we, we come from the general public direction because that's where we all kind of touch base, um, you know. So, for instance, like this last one where you're showing the citizen, mm -hmm. like, like a, pro a project manager would, a pro mm -hmm. project manager would see that, and then what could they do with that? Can they not buy an echo? Oh, it is a, a lot of. Um, uh, products are now nowadays designed as ecosystems, or they're intended to be an ecosystem. Right. Uh, that's also part of like the multifaceted business models where they're going to say like we're going to enable different types of businesses through this application or through this piece of software or through this home assistant. But there you have to make very deliberate choices about the level of transparency. You know, how transparent are we going to be? There's now, now currently there's pretty strong in Europe, the legal, the GDPR uh, legal framework that kind of forces more transparency, but before there wasn't any. So this, and together with the transparent charging station, these were products that were kind of hinting at like a transparent algorithm or like a readable algorithm. Of course, with especially in the last one with a sense of humor, but it, it basically showed like, hey, if you're gonna incorporate these stakeholders into your ecosystem, they're gonna have stakes. They're gonna find a way to do business. They're gonna find a way to, you know, run some metrics in your platform you know, think about it. Think about the implications. This is a very explicit one, but this happens, you know, we're now working with a company who's into um, air, um, aircraft interiors. So to do like everything, like the chairs, the galleys, the trolleys, um, the serving trays, everything. And, and they want to enable an ecosystem in the aircraft. And it's very abstract and it's only like manage, management blah blah and Excel sheets and completely incomprehensible PowerPoints. And then we use these, no, it, it really is. And on, base, on that basis, um, these companies make decisions and they move forward into projects on very flimsy basis until at some point everybody is so invested. There is an uns like a loss avoidance that will, you know, it will happen. The product will happen. Uh, you know, we were lucky that we worked with like super nice people there. But like having like this type of, Snackable content helps to, you know, ground a little bit of what they're doing and what it means to run an ecosystem or to, you know, how to uh, n not put everything behind the, the, the slick facade. Thing, but, uh, 
<laughs> sure, but often, often also you don't know what the right thing is, or you don't realize that things have an yeah, implication so or not. Yeah, it's making them think. Yeah. Uh, I like the way you, you mentioned uh, hacking a narrative as well. Uh, by no means that I mean to present that you're here just because the work you do reflects on projects that we've discussed more, because it does tap into so many questions about how do we talk about ethical concerns we have around technology, or how do we talk about social implications that these technologies may have. And for storytellers, it's about making sure you have the audience, that the audience does understand. What I like about the approach uh, of folklore, maybe it's the definition, but I have a friend who specializes in uh, urban legends. And I just think you know, she's in Brussels, not so far. Which no, yeah. Back, you know, you can get to but her entire line of study is how urban legends are always a way to embed a strategic warning red flags into yeah, society. Yeah, yeah. 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 What you're doing mm -hmm. is kind of a similar way of not, it does, it does partly help um, cultural literacy or public's literacy mm -hmm. about certain uh, connected objects or the way Silicon Valley is developing a culture of monetizing mm -hmm. data, et cetera, and how we're all you know, following that lead. But it's, that's even hard concept. So just making sure like urban legends that you're raising certain flags about potential risks and that's the problem with urban, urban legends too they take a life of their own and suddenly yep. they become false risks at the same time so that's a problem there too but just the idea of hacking that overarching narrative and making sure that you think twice and that's where i see like uh, links in between some of the works that everybody here is working on too, is just how do you raise awareness mm -hmm. without making the audience feel that it's a lecture on raising awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard, tricky part because you don't want to trick them into listening, but you still want to make sure you're raising <laughs> yeah. lights and flags and question marks mm -hmm. where uh, yeah. there's not enough time anymore to well, It's just a challenge in modern times. Yeah. Thank you to terrorization. You know, terrorization for people to Let's shave off a half second on each, mm -hmm. each turn of the crank and it'll yield so much money, but his film does it brilliantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you're tapping into the same theme. Yeah. 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 But, um, the other thing I was going to say, you know, the, about the humane technology group that's just, you know, some of these guys who have been leaving Google are putting together. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. focused more on policy, but mm -hmm. it would be worthwhile chatting with them to see if there's more of like a uh, societal awareness piece. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think they're already talking to the ThingsCon in uh, Berlin the, because we're now also we're quite closely collaborating with Mozilla, and it, it's a very nice constitution of con constellation of, of groups. But uh, yeah, I, I, I love these. Uh, I, I know the group. Yeah. And I mean, I think your project does this very well. Do not crack over now. It's in trouble. I understand, but. <laughs> um, is that the experiential storytelling, you know, that you actually, because you do have the objects and that you mm -hmm. have people, there's the watching it and telling the jokes and then there's mm -hmm. the actually experiencing it yeah. and having it turn back on you, yeah. um, which I think is a really effective way and something you can do with object storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've tried any of that. Iris is an interactive. You can, you know, it has many storylines where you can go into. It has many nooks. Um, the uh, transparent journey station is interactive. Um, so, so those. So you those can feed your own data, for instance, and have it. Mm -hmm. we, we, yeah, there, there's something. There's something that's that's interesting, like practical thing in in the installations that we do, is that we never want to utilize the practices that we're against. Mm -hmm. So we're never going to use anything. You know, using data, tapping into data. We've we've been asked to, to develop like these really dystopian installations that would actually like, yeah. you know, ha hack we people's have phone. A conversation about that, like using but, uh, bad practices no. to highlight them. Were you were saying do not track was in trouble because you of use the the, uh, the technology, technology that yeah. 
So that's a funny anecdote that I wanted to bring back. So 2015, we're doing research on everything that's wrong with data. And I'm tapping into a media lab next door, trying to, OK, let's book an interview with Ethan Zuckerman. Let's try to you know, uh, get some thinkers. And then I mentioned uh, Brett is talking about Cambridge Analytica. And you look at what they have, we're like, no, these guys are saying, well, actually, they're so proud of what they're doing that we should interview them and try to see how they kind of open a door into everything else that's being developed. <laughs> so I forgot about this, but Brett told me, no, no, episode three is exactly based on their own algorithm because they were so happy to share it with us that we based episode three to show how mm -hmm. it actually worked. And yeah. they blatantly said in interviews, we could decide who gets the job. We could actually help like tilt voters for democratic decisions. <laughs> we're so excited about this. This is 2015. The thing where I actually kind of left it, they are the tip of the iceberg, but it's not even the tip of the iceberg, because they're not at the tip. It's just one side of the iceberg, yeah. but there's so many yeah, others right, right, right. to be exactly <laughs> right. with our data. Now the light is on them, so how do we bring audiences to understand the multiple repercussions of how, you know, yesterday uh, we were given a view into the 10 next years of immersive medium and how augmented reality could be tapping into the uh, earplugs that uh, Apple has been sharing that they too can be used as tracking devices and so are the future glasses and, and all I could see is and all of that data will no longer be ours and no control over it so that's the most important thing. Yeah and I think actually for us as storytellers it's an important conversation to think about our own ethical practices as we're developing these interactive and interactive mm -hmm. projects you know is it okay what we're doing. And surprisingly though even when we try to replicate it to explain. Yeah we're still I, doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes and no. what I mean is I thought in an episode on big data that we had a conversation about, I thought people would understand that the results of the algorithms that I created myself, because there's no algorithm, it's me with pieces of paper deciding that, I think I've spent like days doing possibilities. If A plus B plus C plus D plus E, what is my personal bias telling me that person is? And quite blendedly saying if an algorithm works like this, how would I recreate it? But people would still tell me it got me. Like we talked the first day, it gets me. I'm totally like this. And I thought, <laughs> no, it's not. You're not like this. This is like reading your horoscope. This is me telling you, eh. you know, my, but it comes from bias because I'm telling you my cultural background and my upbringing and my prejudice tells me that if you've selected all of these, you're probably that. And then it works some of the time because that's based on some part of the truth. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, trends. The trends are not true, and that's the problem. All of big data developments is understanding trends is true. Yeah. And that's a problem. So, but I, I was surprised even when you recreated, because we did want to use actual algorithms, which the Germans in episode three had no problem using the actual al algorithms, and it'd be as problematic with their, what you can use, you cannot use. We mm -hmm. said, we have to do it from scratch, so just invent one. So it's OK, invent one. How do I get an algorithm? I'm not a mathematician. How do I even start you know, understanding what I'm putting into it? And I thought, oh, that's good. It's going to show people how flawed and biased the algorithm is. Mm -hmm. But still, we've got a lot of people believing. Yeah. But you, you've done this, and you've, you've got into so much data to get so right. I'm like, all that data is called human emotional interpretation. intelligence. <laughs> and mm -hmm. interpretation and bias. It makes that all into a human, and that's the end result again. So algorithms are human. <laughs> no, they're, part, they're, they're part of all of our human biases and interpretations mm -hmm. put together. So yeah. they're like urban legends. Right. Algorithms are urban yeah. legends. That should be in a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> but, but a bit of like the, the, the problem is like we feel completely OK with this explanation or this model. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, and, that's, and that has good, good sides and bad sides and whatever. But what I think in, you know, in general, we don't see a very 
clear and coherent story about the implications of what this data, you know, if you read popular media, it's like Cambridge Analytica, Trump in the White House, black magic in between, it was your data. And that's not what, that's not what happened, you know, and, 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 we, and as, long as, we, it, as long as we fail to explain this in the, like really what, what is data, what, what happens with data, then we get beyond the point where we say, yeah, they're after your data. It's your personal data. It's the algorithm. Because those concepts, they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. And also not in, you know, even to industry people, it doesn't mean anything. You know, and especially to the trained ear, it's like algorithm yeah, can, can be anything. And, and, that's, and that's a problem. And that's, and that's also something that we try to surface, like how, or explain how technology becomes kind of like, the lubricant between business and, and society to, to do things that were previously impossible quicker and without noticing and in this seamless in this seamless experience. And that's new. And that's different.